Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to today's session. Um, it's just about 9.30 uh, UK time, so I'll, I will begin. Uh, firstly, thank you for joining. I would like to remind you that, um, as always, I will be recording the session and I can share that with you afterwards. I will also be sharing with you the PowerPoint slides that I will be using today. Um, so today's session is uh, part one of two, and it's looking at types of assessment. So the type of assessment we're looking at in part one, which is today, is global examination. And then in a couple of weeks time, the session will focus on the local exams and the global assignments. So throughout the session, the areas we will be covering are an overview of the global exam, we're also going to look at the rules and the regulations around actually conducting these exams. We're going to look a little bit at remote invigilation because I, although I know it's not the norm for most centres, there, there can be times when you need to do this so you at least understand what the process is. And then we'll look at submissions, specifically what is it that you need to uh, include in your submissions for the global exam examinations. OK, so let's begin with the overview then. The global exams are marked centrally by NCC education markers. So it means that your role as a centre is simply to make sure you have prepared and conducted the exams at your centre. Uh, you've downloaded them, you've got everything ready, you've done the exam according to our regulations and then send everything to us and we will do the marking. In terms of when the paperwork is available to you, the exam papers themselves. Um, so if you look on our activity schedule, it confirms that we release these via the court's web and we do that 24 hours or one working day ahead of the exam date. And where you will find them is by looking on the live assessments um, section of the courts and clicking on the global examination release. So prior to us releasing it, you won't be able to see that section, the global examination release. But once we have released it, that will become visible and you will then see the exams there. So other than the actual exam itself, there is other documentation that you will need to download. And this documentation can actually be downloaded well in advance. You don't have to wait until one working day before. In fact, it's good practice to check some of these things. For example, the attendance register. It's good practice to check that as soon as it's available so that you can uh, you know, speak to your customer support if you notice anything um, that doesn't look right on the attendance register. So you will download the following documents. You need the attendance register. You need the blank answer booklet that the students will be using for actually conducting, uh, for writing their answers in. You need our seating plan because this is something that you are required to submit to us afterwards. So you need to download that and make sure you have uh, filled that in. You will always need to also send us a chief invigilators report. And we'll talk about the chief invigilator a little more in a moment. And you should download the irregularities report, but it will depend on whether you actually use it or not, whether you're going to be submitting that. But you should also have it available. Very important to note as well that when it comes to global exams, they must happen at the time and date that is uh, stated on the activity schedule. So unlike the local exams, which we'll be talking about next time, where you have some flexibility about when that happens within the local exam week, with the global exam, if you look at the activity schedule, it will actually say, for example, uh, 9 a.m. on the 13th of June, foundation math. So everybody needs to do it at that time. So, for example, if you are a centre in UAE and it's 9 a.m. in UAE, then that is when your foundation maths um, exam would need to start because that's what it says on the attendance uh, on the um, activity schedule. So the chief invigilator, this is one of the first things that you will need to organise is to choose somebody to be your chief invigilator. Um, if you've been an established centre for a while, perhaps you already have somebody that you use all the time, um, but it's good to understand, you know, what are the requirements? 
So this person is going to have the overall responsibility for making sure that everything is ready, that all the paperwork is ready, that the room is as it should be, um, that the exam itself runs smoothly, that everything is returned to us, everything that we require and on time. So obviously it needs to be somebody that is trusted uh, within your centre to, to handle those responsibilities. Um, it's OK if it's a centre coordinator. A lot of the time, you know, people do that or it might be the head of centre, the principal. Um, it's also OK if it's one of the teachers. However, it shouldn't be somebody who normally teaches the students on that particular exam. So, for example, if I was an English language uh, teacher and I'm teaching the DELs and the ELs units, then it's OK for me to be the chief invigilator for the foundation maths because I don't teach that particular unit. So you do have that flexibility there as well. So one of the roles that the, the chief invigilator will need to do is in basically ensuring that your centre has all the necessary documentation on time. So you need to make sure that you have all the question papers. If you're the centre coordinator, perhaps you're the one who's downloading them already from courts. If you're not, then you need to speak to your centre coordinator and make sure that you have all of that. And we would advise that this is done in advance of the exam. You know, if it's available a day before, then that's really when it should be downloaded, printed and stored securely. So that on the day of the exam, there's no stress. You don't have to worry about any technical glitches or you know anything wrong with your machine, that you know that all those exam papers are ready and all the documents you need are ready. Uh, so you would have downloaded them. And if it is an exam that requires graph paper, so let's say it's one of the maths exams, then you would have ensured that those are available for your students because we don't provide those. So you need to make sure that you have the graph paper ready for your students. As well as the paperwork, you'd also need to prepare the actual exam venue. So uh, step one is making sure that you've actually prepared a space that will accommodate the expected number of students. And also that you've allocated the correct number of invigilators. So the rules for invigilators is that there must be a minimum of two invigilators in any room for up to 25 candidates and then a minimum of one extra invigilator for every extra 25 candidates. So what we mean by that, if I give you an example, let's say if I have 53 students who are going to do an exam, I'm going to need a total of four invigilators because I need two invigilators for that initial group of 25. I then need an additional one for the extra 25, an additional one for the extra three. So in total, I would have a minimum of four invigilators. And the chief invigilator obviously needs to work very closely with those invigilators, make sure they understand what's expected and what's their role on the day. So when it's the actual day of the exam as well, in terms of preparing, uh, you need to ensure that you know where all the students are going to be sitting, that the desks have been arranged in such a way that it matches the seating plan and that the desks have the student's name and the student ID on there and that the invigilators are able to direct the students to where they are supposed to be sitting. So that all needs to be set up for. And then there are also certain requirements of things in the room itself. So we would require that there is a clock in the room that is visible to all the students. So they always know uh, how much time they have. You also have to make sure that obviously you have additional things like pencils and pens in case an invigilator or a student might need one. You need to make sure that all the students have their answer booklets where they're going to write their answers. Or if they're using a uh, lined exam paper, um, then maybe you make sure they have the front cover uh, page at least. And make sure that those desks are ready, that they have already taped onto them the student information, the name and the ID so that it's easy to direct the students to the right place. And as mentioned before about the graph paper, making sure that's already there in the venue as well. We also want to make sure that the um, the room and the facilities are comfortable for the students. So this chief invigilator has must have already made sure that the, the lighting in the room is sufficient for those doing the exams, that there are adequate toilet facilities nearby and that the students will be informed of where they are. 
that the room is uh, in such a way that you can have all the candidates facing in the same direction, that it's a comfortable um, space to be in. It's well ventilated. If air conditioning is needed, that is set to the correct level, or if it's heating, that that is at the correct level. And that the students have comfortable and suitable chairs and desks to be using as well. You also have to consider the way that those desks are set up. So you need to make sure that there's at least a desk width between each student so that it's not possible for them to uh, look at each other's work and cheat in that way. If there is a telephone uh, in the room, make sure it's turned off or rerouted and it's not going to ring uh, during the exam. You also need to have at the kind of head of the exam room a, a table, which is kind of the base for the chief invigilator and the invigilators. That's not to say that that's where they're going to be stuck throughout the exam, because obviously part of their role is to be patrolling the room and keeping an eye on what's happening. But that's kind of the base where um, they have all the things they need. Um, and of course, the room should have no other use during the exam so that the students are not going to be disturbed. Then some final requirements for the room are that the room must be quiet. So inside the room is quiet, but also that there's not too much noise nearby from outside to disturb the students. That there's no kind of electrical, um, you know, electronic equipment like PCs, laptops or servers. And a timetable for that exam to be displayed at the front of the um, entrance to the room. So the first thing you will need to do when the students arrive is actually to check the ID and it's a very important um, step that must be done. Um, so even though you may know the students, students should not be permitted into the exam unless they have shown and brought their ID. So very important that the students are advised of that beforehand. And obviously there's lots of different forms of ID. We've given you some examples here that you might you might use or accept. Um, and you obviously will also need to consider how you're going to check someone's identity if they're wearing a face covering. Uh, we don't want anybody to be feeling uncomfortable or disadvantaged, so you need to have thought about this in advance and how you're going to handle that situation. Uh, we would expect you to have arranged a private room where the person can go with a female member of staff so that you can check that the ID matches the person as well. So anybody who does not have their ID with them on that day, unfortunately, they will not be permitted to sit the exam and they would have to sit in another cycle and bring their ID um, in that cycle. So please make sure that students are aware that this ID check is going to happen. Um, so in terms of preparing the students and what's permitted, so once they have entered, you've checked their ID, they need to sign the official NCC Education Attendance Register, which would have been downloaded previously. On the register will be the list of all the students who are there. And so the student just needs to sign beside their name to say that they, ha they have attended the exam. Um, you obviously need to speak to them about what is and is not permitted. So, you know, they can have their pencils, their pens and things like that. If the exam allows a calculator, then they can have that. If it does not allow a calculator, um, then they cannot have that with them at their desk. Anything that is not specifically allowed, for example, um, dictionaries, um, smartwatches, phones, things like that, they would all be handed into the invigilators and kept somewhere else to be returned to them at the end of the exam. It can just be kept at the back of the room and returned to them at the end. And of course, important that all of these are switched off. We don't want anybody being interrupted during the exams. If they have brought a phone or a device with them, it's turned off and it's left with the invigilators. Um, students should understand that if they are found to be in possession of a, a device, a smart device, that it would be leading to allegations of cheating. Um, they should be informed of where the toilet facilities are and that that should be done before the start of the exam because we really don't want to be um, disrupting the exam or leave them open to any accusations of misconduct if they're going during the exam. Um, they're going to be directed to their seat where you can display the examination slip that has all the students details on there. And once you get to about five minutes before the exam is due to start, you would close the doors. People on the outside are then aware that an exam is starting. People on the inside are ready 
five minutes before so that we know the exam will start on time. So in terms of general rules for during the exam, that chief invigilator needs to be there throughout the exam. Uh, in fact, we would expect them to be there a minimum of one hour before um, so that they have made sure that all these things that need to be in place are in place. And they need to stay throughout the exam. The chief invigilator and the invigilators must be contactable by NCC education. Um, so if it's somebody other than the normal centre administrator, um, the centre administrator needs to be able to contact them because if we inform you something about the exam, you need to be able to pass that information on to the invigilators. Um, so making sure that all your contact information is up to date. And we've already talked about the minimum requirements for invigilators, so we won't go over that again. And then in terms of running the exam, so the students themselves, on my slide it says, you know, ar ar arrive 15 minutes before the exam, but I think you need to use your discretion about your number of students taking the exam. If you have a large cohort, you're probably better off suggesting that they come 30 minutes before the exam so that you can do the things like ensuring they've been to the toilet, collecting anything they don't need, signing the attendance register, you know, giving them the instructions and all the things they need to be aware of. So the minimum is 15 minutes, but if you've got a large cohort, you probably want them to arrive about 30 minutes before. And then we, you know, suggest that those students should be actually be seated at their desks about 10 minutes before the exam is going to start. And then, that, like I said before, five minutes before you would close the doors and then you're certain that everything's going to run, run smoothly. Um, in terms of latecomers, we, we can allow someone to come in as long as it's no more than 30 minutes after the start of the exam. So if the exam starts at nine, by 9.30, nobody else can enter the room. Um, when they come in, you still have to go through all those checks we talked about, checking the ID, checking what things they have on them, making sure they understand the instructions. So that's all taking the time away as well. They also need to understand that the exam won't be extended. If it's a two hour exam, just because they came 30 minutes late doesn't mean that they can they can have that full two hours. The, the exam must still finish at the same time and they won't be given any extra time. So it's, it's kind of um, unfortunate for them that they would have had less time to do the exam. Um, once the exam has started, if somebody really does need to go to the toilet, then we would need to allow them to do so. However, an invigilator must uh, go with them. Um, and you know, the purpose for this is to be able to, you know, check the room. So after they've been, make sure there's nothing that's in the room that they could be using to cheat. There's nothing they've left behind that another student could use later when they come in. So it's just making sure there's nothing within there that's, um, you know, could be used for cheating. Um, and if somebody is unwell. Obviously, we have to allow them to, to leave the room. It might be that they sit down, they have some water and they feel better in about five, ten minutes. That's fine. They can go and they can continue with their exam. However, if we get to, to 15 minutes and they're still feeling unwell, then we would have to tell them, I'm sorry, you know, you can't go back in the exam room now. Um, obviously, if they're not well, it's not the best time for them to be doing their exam anyways. Um, and any incidents that happen during the exam or around the time of the exam, they must be logged on the irregularities report. So an example, like if somebody did go to the toilet on the irregularities report, you'd be making a note of the student, the student ID and what time they went. So those things would be noted there. Also note, you know, which invigilator went with them. So it's clear that you followed our our processes. If somebody was ill and had to leave, you know, you'd note all these things down. Even somebody coming in late, it's still something a little bit irregular. So all those things would be noted in the irregularities report, just so we are aware of how things worked during the exam. Once 40 minutes has elapsed, it would be possible if somebody felt right, I've, I've answered everything, I've done my exam, it would be possible for them to finish the exam at that point and leave, but they will not be permitted to return uh, back into the exam room again. 
Um, <clears throat> hopefully the teachers would have um, you know, spoken to students before and discouraged them from, from doing this kind of thing, because if it's a two hour exam, it's two hours for a reason. And we want them to do the best they can, but they should be aware that they do have that possibility of leaving once it's been 40 minutes. Um, at the end of the exam, you, the students aren't allowed to take any question papers away with them. Um, so as mentioned, anything unusual if a student leaves uh, before the end or things like that would be put into the invigilators report. So as with all exams and tests, invigilators can't offer any advice to the students about their work. Even if you spot a mistake, you can't point anything out. The only thing you can tell them is if there is something that you have been instructed by NCC Education that we would like you to inform them. If you do have suspected malpractice, for example, cheating, you know, someone looking at some notes or looking at a, taking out a phone or students talking or whatever, you, you deal with it at the time. So if it's if it's material they're not supposed to have, you would confiscate that material um, and you would make a note on the students uh, work about what time it happened. So let's say it happened at 10, you would write on the student's answer book at 10 a.m. That's going to be useful for you later when you're completing the irregularities report because you're going to have all the details about when it happened and who it was, etc. The candidate would still be allowed to continue with their exam, even though you've confiscated something from them, they still get to continue to the end. However, at the end, you ask them to remain in the room and you inform them that you are reporting this to NCC Education and you ask them to countersign the irregularities report and you let them know that they do have the right to send a written explanation to NCC Education using the email address that's displayed on the screen now. And they must do that within 24 hours of getting the notification. Um, so all the examination booklets and the question papers will be collected at the end and the question papers themselves must be destroyed. Um, you will have access to past papers, but the dates for that is, is stated in the um, activity schedule uh, of when you'll be able to use those revision purposes. But straight after the exam, those papers do need to be destroyed, the question papers. You would then sort the exam booklets into candidate number um, as per the attendance register. And anybody who was absent, you would write an absent next to their name on the register. Uh, we don't want any blank spaces. So next to each person's name will either be the signature to say they were there or absent to say that they were not there. Um, so we would expect that you, you, you're going to scan everything and send it to us electronically. So we're not wanting you to send us the actual papers themselves. We want scans of the original answer booklet. That's what we're looking for. Um, and it's important that the chief invigilator has made sure that we have all of that. We have that for every single student, that every single student has completed um, the answer booklet correctly, as in where it asks for name and ID, uh, you know, there's student number, that all of that has been completed. So it's probably better to check that you know, before you allow the students to go to make sure everyone has has completed that. Um, and then you then need to scan those documents and send them to NCC Education. But we'll talk about the submission side um, shortly. So remote invigilation, it, like I said, it's not something that um, every centre does. And in fact, the default um, method of um, doing exams is face to face. So we will always work on the assumption that your exams are happening face to face. If you require for the exam to happen remotely, then there is a process in place that you must follow uh, before doing that. Don't just assume that you can do them that way and then send the paperwork and everything will be OK, because in all likelihood um, those exams wouldn't be accepted. So there's a process in place that you would need to follow. There, there are lots of different reasons why you might need to do remote invigilation. It might be that something uh, has happened within your country where people are being advised um, to stay at home and therefore um, the safest and you know the best way, the only way for them to do the exam would be to do that remotely. So you would just uh, follow the procedures to request that for all of your students. It might be that um, 
this is a reset and this, the student who's doing this reset actually um, is not from the, the area, has gone back home and it's inconvenient to come back just for this one exam. So that one student is doing it remotely. It might be that most of the students are doing it at your centre, but there's maybe one or two students who, for some reason, had to return, go home or travel somewhere, but they still want to do the exam. So I'm only requesting for these you know, specific students. Or it might be that you are a centre who does all of your delivery online and does all of your assessing online because that's what you are accredited um, to do. Even in this circumstance, you still need to request it each time so that we are aware which centres are doing it remotely and which centres are doing it face to face. So the procedure for that is the first step is that you would need to complete um, what we call the registrations, exceptional circumstances, policy and procedure form. It's a very long and windy title. Um, this form is used for various different things. So it's not only used for remote invigilation, it's also used in circumstances where you've needed to change the exam day or you've not been able to send us things on time because of circumstances beyond your control. But in the case of remote invigilation, you would just scroll down to where the circumstances are and you would tick remote invigilation so we understand that, that is why you're completing this form. Uh, it's very straightforward. If you just look at the categories it's asking you for, obviously at the top you're filling in the details or the person who's, who's doing the form, the name, the title, the centre name, etc. You provide us with the cycle, so for example summer and the year 2024, you provide that information. You provide us with which is the qualification that you need the remote um, exams. It might be one, it might be more than one. So you tick the ones that are relevant, which uh, programme is it the students are studying. And then a bit further down in the form, there's a section where it asks you what are the specific exams that need to happen remotely. And it's only exams because assignments are, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't need to be face to face anyway. So which are the specific exams? So you, you write down which they are. And there's a section where you're going to tell us who are the affected students. So it might be your entire cohort. It might be one or two people. So you, you give that information as well. And they also ask for the reason why you're doing it remotely. So it might be like you said, so and so has had to travel unexpectedly, but they still want to do the exam. It might be the government has advised that, you know, we should all work from home so students can't go into school. It might be we always do our exams remotely. So. You fill in whatever the reason is. We ask that you please do that at least two weeks before the exam. It gives us the time to approve it and it gives us the time to give you the training that you will require and for you to make sure you have all the processes in place as well. So if at all possible, please do that two weeks before the exam's date. And you will then um, receive a formal uh, reply from our head of assessments where they will have signed to approve it and say, yes, you can go ahead and do these remotely. So you, you must have that as well. And that will be followed up by some training from your academic standards manager um, to explain what is the requirements, what do we expect in terms of how you're going to uh, invigilate the exams. OK, so in terms of preparing, this time you don't need to prepare a room, but you do need to make sure that whoever's invigilating and whatever students are involved, that they, they their equipment meets all of our requirements. Uh, so you need to think about the screen resolution, the operating systems, the sort of web browser they've got. You need to make sure they've got operational webcam, microphone and speakers. You need to make sure that internet speed is um, sufficient, uh, that they do actually have access to some kind of virtual meeting technology, whatever you plan to use, whether it's you know Google Meet, Zoom, Teams, whatever. And that they have all the necessary stationery that they would need, which normally as a centre you would provide, you know, pens and papers. Um, you know, they, they won't have an actual answer booklet this time, so they're going to have to make sure they have paper that they can write on. So making sure that they have all of these things as well. So for preparing for the exam, the key here is the number of students that are going to be doing the exam remotely. Each group of six students will need to be invigilated using a separate online meeting link. I mean, the reason for this is it's, it's, um, it's quite a stressful process 
remote invigilation. There's so much that you need to keep an eye on. There's so much that you need to do at the beginning to prepare for the exam to start. And so we have decided that six is the ideal number to have on one uh, meeting link so that you can be fully, um, you know, looking at the process and making sure that things are being done properly. So what I mean by that is that, so if, let's take an example of if you had 21 students doing it remotely. So you would need to divide those students into groups of six. So let's say I've got group A and group A is a group of six students and they have one uh, online meeting link. Let's say it's Zoom. They have one Zoom link and they have their two invigilators for group A. Group B is made up of another six students. They have their own uh, Zoom link and they have their own uh, two invigilators. Then group C, I have another group of six students. They've got another Zoom link. And they've also got their two invigilators. And then I still have these three extra students. So those three students can be group D and they will have their Zoom link and their two invigilators. When the exam starts, all those four groups are doing the exam at the same time, but in their separate uh, Zoom um, meeting rooms with their separate invigilators. OK. So really important that that is adhered to, first of all. The exam, like all global exams at NCC Education, must take place at the time and date that's specified on the activity schedule. So even if you have a student, let's let's say I, my centre is in Pakistan and I have some students that originally come from UAE and those students have gone back home and maybe there's a time difference between our time zones. Because my centre is in Pakistan, if the activity schedule says 9 a.m., then that exam must happen at 9 a.m. in Pakistan and the students in UAE will have to do it at 9 a.m. in Pakistan. So you all must be doing it at the same time. But the time zone that you go off is the time zone where your centre is based. Hopefully that makes sense. So in preparation before that, you would schedule a kind of navigation test, like a dry run to give those students an understanding of what's it going to be like, what's the expectation, so that when they arrive for the exam, they already know, right, this is how I need to set up my camera, this is what it's going to be like, and, and they don't have to be worrying about that on the day of the exam. So two days in advance, these are the things that you're going to discuss with the students. You're going to tell them, you know, what's the link they're going to be using to join the actual exam, um, you know, meeting. You're going to share with them a link to the exam paper because how you're going to do it is you're going to create um, a password protected, um, you know, drive. Maybe it's a Microsoft or Google or something, but students will only be able to access it once you give them the password. So during this um, navigation test, you're going to explain this to them. You're going to say, here's the link. When we start the exam, I'm going to share the password. You'll be able to open it and then you'll be able to see your question papers. Um, at that, it, during that navigation test, you also go through what's the list of all the equipment that they're going to need. Do they have their pencils? Do they have the paper? Do they have everything? And, and make sure they know what they must have on that day. And finally, inform them that that, that um, exam is going to be recorded, that Zoom call or that um, Teams, whatever, it's going to be recorded. And just by attending, they consent to that being recorded because we need that in case there's any allegation of misconduct, we may want to review that recording. And in terms of how NCC education um, is involved, we do spot checks on the remote invigilation. So it means that you must invite your academic standards manager to the Teams meeting or the Zoom meeting, whatever it is, because what that person will do is um, they will drop in and out. So at certain points within the exam, they will they will come onto the meeting, they'll keep the camera off, they'll keep their microphone off, they'll just observe what's going on to be sure that, you know, you're kind of following our regulations. So we ask that you share that link no less than two working days before the exam. It's important, you know, we're all busy, we all have other, um, you know, meetings and things that we're doing, so we need to plan our schedule and know when it's happening so we can ensure there is somebody there to um, invigilate, to do a spot check invigilation from NCC Education. 
Um, if it's not your normal academic stand manager, it might be one of the team that works with another centre. Uh, you know, we'll support each other to make sure that these um, spot checks are done. So please do share that link so it can be shared with whoever's going to be observing. Then on the actual day of the exam, um, so this is what would happen for um, each. Let's say you've got a group of six and you're ready to start. The invigilators and the, and the students would join the meeting, the online meeting, 30 minutes before the exam is going to start and you would start the recording from that point. Then we need to, for each of those students, we need to scan the room. We need to make sure that the environment that they're in, that there's nothing there that can be used for cheating. So each of those six students, in turn, you're going to ask them to do a sweep of the room. We need to see behind the computer screen any paper um, that's around and we need to see the walls to make sure there's nothing on there that they could use for cheating. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why we have this limit of six because it does take some time to go through that with every single candidate. So you would do that um, first. Um, you also, you would have gone through all this so they are aware of this when you had that navigation test, but you need to actually get them to set up the um, the room in such a way that you can see the screen, the student screen, and you can see the table and the space around them. So you can either do that by using a smartphone or tablet in a position that's showing the room um, in which they're taking the exam and also the screen, or you can do that by using a mirror. And I have a picture here to demonstrate how you can actually see, um, you know, what's around the, the student. You can see their screen, you can see the table, etc. Just as with the face to face exams, you still need to check the identity of all students. They're going to do that by just displaying their photographic ID, holding that up to the camera for you to see. Just as with the um, the face to face where I said you have to you know, consider what will happen if somebody's wearing a face covering. So you would have thought of that when you're arranging your meeting rooms to make sure that if somebody needs to show their face to, to confirm their ID, that they're only there with you know, female um, people. Um, of course, they're not allowed to have their books open. They're not allowed to use any notes or materials to help them, just as the same as in the face to face exam. And we keep talking about this graph paper, but it is actually more of an issue with the online exams because sometimes uh, because they don't have the graph paper, they think, oh, I can just use a software on my computer to generate um, a graph. Well, if they did that, they would score zero. So um, for that particular question, so really important that you have made sure the students have their graph paper before. Um, and then invigilation during the exam. When they're ready, so you've checked the room, you've checked their ID, you, they have everything they need and you're satisfied with the environment, you can now share the password for that um, password protected drive where you have stored the exam paper. They will then open that up and it will be on their screen and they can now start the exam writing their answers on um, a piece of paper, the paper that they have. The invigilators, they will leave their cameras on but they will mute themselves so that you know they're not disturbing the students. And the um, students themselves, they must keep their camera on to so the webcam, the second device if they're using one or they might be using a mirror, and they must also keep their microphone on so you can hear what's happening in the room as well. And at this point, the students are not allowed to leave the room. If they leave the room, that's it. They can't continue with the exam. So if you do suspect any malpractice, just as you would in the normal exam, you're just going to make a note, you know, what time has it happened? How long has it happened for? What happened? All of that will go in the invigilators report. Um, so let's say, for instance, you noticed a student um, taking out um, some notes and looking at the notes. You know, you would need to speak to that student at the end of the exam and say, please, can you stay on after the other students have left? You're going to do a, a find another sweep of the room just to check if there's anything else in the room that you should be aware of and inform them that you're actually going to report this to NCC Education and that they have the right to appeal using the email address that's on the screen. Um, if you have any technical 
problems, audio or video um, disruption, anything like that, please just make a note of it in the irregularities report. There are some examples stated on the screen, but I think the general rule is that anything that happens, it doesn't need to be limited to, to what's there. Anything that happens, a camera going off, the sound going off, whether it's for the invigilator or for the uh, a student, um, just make a note who was involved, what happened, how long did it last? Just let us know exactly what it was. Do that in the irregularities report. So now at the end of the exam, the procedure would be that um, all the students are going to remain on that online uh, meeting uh, call because um, there's things that need to be done at the end of the exam. So even if they finish early, they're not able to kind of stop and leave. They need to, they need to stay on. So when the exam is over, you inform the students, right, OK, you put your microphone back on and inform them, right, the, the, the exam is finished, stop writing. And um, what you need to do now is um, the way you're collecting the work is you're asking the students to take pictures of their work using a smartphone or a tablet, and they're going to send that work to the invigilator. They need to stay on the call while this is happening, because when the invigilator receives that work, they need to look at it and make sure they can see everything, that everything is there, every um, page of the student's work is there, no work is missing, it's all clear, visible, so that it can be marked later. We don't want a situation where um, afterwards we discover that, oh, part of the page was missing, you couldn't actually see some of the student's answer. So you check all that and when you're satisfied that you have all of the student's work and it's all clear and visible, the quality of the picture is fine, then you can, uh, at that point, you can then end the exam and end the call with the students. Um, and you would also now remove the access to the question papers so that they cannot see that anymore. So in terms of submitting to us, in the case of the remote um, invigilation, you've got those pictures. In the case of face-to-face, -face, you've got the scanned copies of the students' uh, work. So you collect all of the um, students' examination answer booklets, and you have them all um, either scanned as um, PDFs or pictures, and you're going to create a single PDF for each student, and you're going to label the student the, the work in this way. So if my name, if I'm a student and my name is John Smith, you start with my candidate number, as you can see on the screen here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then my name, John Smith, and then the exam, ITCS exam. So that's how you would uh, title my PDF of my um, answer booklet. And you have all the various students' answer booklets together, and you're going to put them into a zip folder, and you're going to name them according to your centre name or code, and then your um, the units, for example, ITCS, and the cycle, for example, spring or summer 2024. Along with all the students' work, all the answer booklets, these are the other documents that we require. We require the completed official attendance register. Uh, so with the one that has the signatures of all the students beside it or absent beside it. If anyone has done it remotely, then obviously they can't sign, but you can write remote invigilation next to that student's name. We want the seating plan, so that should be returned to us. And we also want the chief invigilators report. So those are mandatory. The irregularities report will only be if there was an incident that you needed to report to us and you've written that in the irregularities report, then you would uh, send that to us as well. So all of those documents are to be uploaded on the court's uh, web and they should be done 48 hours after the completion of each exam. Um, we do have guides available if you're not sure on the process. We also had um, a previous webinar on the process of submitting these, so engage with those. Or again, if you're unsure, maybe ask for additional training from your customer support of how to do it, whether uh, you have a training session or you just join a Teams call and share your screen and show them whatever issues you are having. And the sooner you do that, the better to avoid, you know, getting um, you know, beyond the deadline for, for these. OK, so that is it in terms of my uh, presentation. There's more information on these topics that you can find 
on NCC Education's um, academic misconduct policy and things like that, um, our assessment um, procedures. You can find all of those on uh, Courts Web and on our website as well. So I'm now going to open up in case anybody has any questions that they would like to ask at this time. If you do, I think you, your um, mic might be disabled, so please just put, tap, type something in the chat if there's something you'd like me to clarify. No, no problem. Uh, if there isn't, then we shall leave it there. Um, please do, um, you know, reach out if you think of something afterwards, either to me or if um, I know some of you are here from um, MUNO centres, you can reach out to MUNO uh, for any further support. And as I said, in a couple of weeks time, I'm going to do another session, but that's going to focus on local exams and global examinations. OK, so I wish you guys all the best for the rest of the week. Thank you for joining and hope to see you soon. Bye.